Hello everyone. Good evening. A uh, warm welcome to our session. This is probably the last session with our speakers. And in this session, we have a very good experts from the field. But before starting that one, I would like to say that we are having this program during the celebration of Global Entrepreneurship Week. And uh, you will be happy to know that who is responsible for this Global Entrepreneurship Week around the world, she has joined us. So we are really proud uh, to have her in our session, as well as we have another big speaker with us who is actually impacting in the society. So uh, don't waste our time. Let's meet our speakers today. Uh, for the session COVID-19 and the women entrepreneurship, we have the speaker with us, uh, Ms. Buki Chuhadar, Vice President, Global Entrepreneurship Network. And we have with us Samar al Sharaf, co-founder and CEO, she is Arab. Welcome to our session. So, it's, it's really amazing that both of you have joined and you will be talking about the most recent topic is, that is happening around the globe, COVID-19 and women entrepreneurship. But before going to that session, I would like to uh, know a little bit about yourself, if you can share with us. Start with Buki. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here. And I'm so excited to be in this session on the sixth day of Global Entrepreneurship Week. I've been following the Women Entrepreneurship Congress um, from the very beginning, the past three days, and I can't believe how many amazing women um, said so many interesting things about the current ecosystem, what we're going through, and and um, how we can overcome some of the challenges coming up. I think this should be eventually made into a book. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Beauty said, Global Entrepreneurship Week this year is in 180 countries. It's one week of celebrating entrepreneurship. And I'm very proud to be part of uh, this organization for the past six years, working with amazing people uh, from around the wor world organizing this week. Everybody does this on a volunteer basis. Their organizations may have the entrepreneurship mandate, but I think what's really important about this week is that we all spend uh, sleepless days and nights um, bringing the ecosystem together, having this conversation. And this year has been no different despite all the challenges we're facing. In any case, thank you for having me and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Ms. Burki. Now I would like to know from Ms. Summer. Uh, sure, uh, Beauty. Thank you so much for having me here today. And, and it's such a pleasure also to meet uh, Buki. I wish we'd met before. Uh, this week is obviously a fantastic initiative. And I see Beauty, you've been extremely active putting this together. So kudos to you on putting such a fantastic lineup of speakers and topics to be addressed. Uh, thank you so much. I'm here representing uh, my startup is uh, called She is Arab and uh, um, I'm based in Dubai by the way so this is where our business is headquartered um, and we are a business with a vision where uh, hopefully Arab women are represented equally in the global economy. So we are truly on a mission to magnify the role and achievements of Arab women uh, you know, globally to inspire future generations, to break stereotypes, and, and to really support uh, women's uh, professional development and growth uh, opportunities across the region. So really working to advocate greater awareness of their excellence. Um, so what else can I tell you? Uh, I'm, an, I'm obviously an entrepreneur. I come from an entrepreneurial family as well. So, um, but I do have uh, experience having worked with international organizations uh, on lots of different uh, social and policy issues 
uh, and um, I'm really delighted to uh, share this uh, panel with uh, Vyuke today to discuss this really um, timely topic about entrepreneurship and COVID-19. I mean, it's something we're all struggling with nowadays, um, and uh, we'll get into that with you. Thank you much, Samar. Uh, we are really grateful to you that you have joined today. And now going back to our main discussion topic is that, um, yes, we have recently acknowledged about the crisis that the women entrepreneurs are having due to the COVID-19. So how do you actually evaluate these things? How have women entrepreneurs experienced the COVID-19 crisis in terms of their particular business as well as managing their families? So starting with Buki. Okay, so where to start? Um, I was looking, I was doing some, um, I was doing some research on the topic before this panel and I actually wanted to give a little bit of an overview of, of where we are with COVID around the world because I feel like we are almost living in parallel universes at the moment. Okay, everybody's, the global economy is of course, affected uh, by COVID, but the um, how um, countries around the world were affected is not uh, equal. So today, well, well, according to the October statistics, let's say there, there are about over 55 million cases and 30 million of these are in the um, top five countries uh, with the cases. And these are the US, India, Brazil, France and Russia. And then there is another um, 15 million in the next 15 countries. And um, it's interesting, um, in the top 20, 10 countries are from Europe, six are from Americas, and then the rest are from other parts of the world. For example, from Africa, there's only South Africa in that list. So um, just looking at these statistics, 80% of the cases are in you know, 20 countries. So uh, it's natural that um, it is reflected differently. But of course, there is a crisis. And during the crisis, women tend to get affected uh, more than men. So that's like, a, uh, that's like an overall um, trend that's been happening throughout the history. Um, some of the reasons for that is we tend to earn less as female entrepreneurs. Um, we get less investments. It may be because there was some discussion in the previous panels. We ask less. Um, we ask for less. Um, um, we have fewer savings. Um, there is more women in informal sectors. Um, we have to, of course, you're going to come to this. Uh, we have to take take care of the unpaid care and uh, domestic work. We have to look uh, after our families and our children. And um, so th there are many reasons that can actually uh, follow. And if, if we look at, you know, what the statistics are saying, if we look at um, UN women's um, statistics, for example, um, they're expecting the um, gender poverty gap uh, to worsen uh, with this pandemic. There will be millions of millions more women um, who will um, reach extreme poverty uh, and especially uh, the ages between 25 and uh, 34 will be more affected by this. And um, just uh, before I pass it on, um, one of the reasons uh, why uh, female entrepreneurs are affected more is also uh, because of the sectors uh, we operate in. Um, so the most important industries uh, for female entrepreneurs are the food service, uh, retail and entertainment. And uh, these are all um, um, sectors that have been shaken uh, by this crisis. And then, of course, I, I mentioned the informal economies. Uh, that, that's also um, very much affected uh, by this crisis. Thank you so much, Buki. If I ask the same question to uh, Ms. Samar, uh, with the lots of female entrepreneurs, what do you actually experience regarding the crisis they are facing now? 
Thank you, Beauty, for this question. Um, I fully agree, obviously, with everything that Beauty, uh, with, that Beauty mentioned. Uh, I mean, it's a stumbling block for women all around the world and, and not just in one particular reason. But I fully agree with her that, you know, uh, countries are affected in differently. You know, the way the countries have been affected isn't equal. And I yes. really believe that this would vary depending on where you are located in the world, the social, the economic, the cultural, and even the political situation um, surrounding you pre-COVID-19. Uh, so um, a lot of factors come into play. But as uh, Buki rightly mentioned, you know, it's uh, particularly affected women. Uh, you know, we're currently reading a, a million reports about uh, a she session that is currently taking place. Um, the fear of, you know, reversing hard-won gains uh, pre-pandemic uh, and over the past years, whether or not we're going to achieve the SDGs. Uh, there's a lot that's been, you know, that's coming into play. And, and globally, yes, women are bearing the brunt. Um, you know, if I can give uh, just one statistic from my part of the world, um, Oxfam is, is uh, estimating that 1.7 million jobs will be lost in the region, out of which 700,000 are jobs held by women. So this just tells you to put things in perspective. This shows the gravity of the situation, given that women's share of the workforce is only at you know about 20%. So like, it's 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 pretty drastic in that sense. And and obviously yes, it is because they are um, most of them um, you know are in sectors mentioned uh, by Buca, such as retail and so on. A lot of them work in the informal sector as well. So uh, the SMEs have obviously been hardly hit. I, for one, know a number of entrepreneurs who've had to shut down their businesses. Um, and it's definitely been a struggle for us as entrepreneurs to keep our businesses afloat, to um, digitize wherever possible, and to pivot with our business models to accommodate the changes um, that have been taking place. And, and on the topic, and I think it's really important that you ask this question of like balancing you know, yes. work and family. I mean, we cannot ignore the the the, the challenges associated with the um, with working remotely. You know, it it's been a, a struggle, and especially when there was like a quarantine phase. Um, anyone attending today or listening who's a mother out there will know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when kids were not going to school as well between homeschooling and trying to balance work and, and additional, you know, domestic responsibilities that uh, one would have or perhaps caretaking responsibilities. We already know that more than 70% of healthcare workers are women. We know that almost 90% of personal care workers are women, so whether for children or the elderly. So it, 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 it's by default that we have been um, hit the hardest. Um, I could claim that, for example, the few that or the the smaller number of women who work in uh, in perhaps sectors like STEM, which make up a very small percentage. I mean, globally, on average, you'd see it varying between what 16 to a maximum of 25 or 28 percent. Um, Perhaps the, it may have fared well for these uh, ladies because, you know, they have STEM jobs, they're more, uh, you know, it's easier for them to work remotely, they may have not lost their jobs, but when you think of the work-life um, balance and, you know, uh, again, whether or not they have children at home and, and whether or not they have um, uh, good internet access and so on, lots of factors come into play. So. Globally, it's been uh, tough for everybody, but certainly uh, harder for women. So uh, obviously, we will talk about the silver linings uh, later in this talk. But for now, this would be my two cents on it. Thank you so much, Samar. Yes, um, the work for the women has been doubled. When the COVID started, they started to stay at home and they stuff for the mothers out there. Uh, so, but uh, what do you think about what are the policy makers should uh, actually impact on this issue? Or what are the measures actually they can take to address this issue and minimize the crisis as much as they can, starting with Bouquet? 
Um, just to um, add to uh, Samar's points, I think um, the more you dig deeper into the subject, the more comes out too. Um, so whether uh, you are a minority uh, in your country really does make a difference too. Um, the minority populations uh, around the world have been affected uh, a lot more deeper uh, by this uh, than others. And of course, um, um, some are got into it, the dig digital divide um, is, um, I think, even more overwhelming uh, for them um, than it was before. It affects, you know, the way they, their families function, the way uh, their children access to education. It's, it affects uh, many factors. So it, it's tough. And I mean, I must say, um, I would not want to work for the government, any government right now, <laughs> because their job is really difficult. Um, so I can see, you know, um, a lot of things from their perspective too. Um, we as the entrepreneurship support organizations uh, have all these uh, demands um, from the governments during these difficult times, but of course, you know, they can only do so much. Um, so there is a lot of um, uh, suggestions out there. Um, I'm gonna, I'll maybe give a few examples from these and um, share um, some of my perspective as well. Um, so I think considering the situation, uh, there needs to be some direct income support uh, for women, especially the uh, women owned and uh, women led businesses. So the governments uh, should make an effort uh, to prioritize these. Um, this has been said uh, throughout the day, throughout these past few days and uh, throughout these uh, past few months. Um, and um, it's not limited to uh, supporting the women-led businesses. I think also the um, women uh, workers, women um, employees uh, should, be, should get um, a different uh, support um, compared to their um, and male counterparts just because you know of the uh, inequality um, and then of course the child care support uh, and again that's that was brought up many times so most women um, are forced to um, exit the labor force especially in countries where child care is so expensive that uh, it doesn't make sense uh, for them to work anymore um, but Similarly, you know, around the world, it just makes the situation uh, a lot tougher. Um, I think um, one suggestion I would have uh, personally for government is um, getting more uh, for them to get more involved and or to give more support to um, research on uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, because I think um, there is a, a lot of research already out there, although not enough. And uh, what we see from all that uh, research um, is always very similar. So women uh, in entrepreneurship um, do perform well. Um, um, companies uh, with female founders um, perform um, 60 plus percent uh, better than uh, companies with all male founders. Uh, women um, um, exit um, much faster uh, than men do. Um, there, is, there, is, there are many statistics out there that support the case for women. Um, and I think if the governments can play a role in emphasizing these, that will really help uh, shifting that mindset um, around women. And then, of course, uh, one uh, one final thing I would add to this is um, the women investors. Um, so uh, when we look at the investment world, um, I mean, if we say there is about um, about 25% of all the um, entrepreneurs are women, um, only 18% of all investments uh, go to women. Um, it's still, you know, um, disproportional and uh, it still does need improvements. 
And one of the reasons for this is because most of the investors are male and, um, you know, they uh, invest uh, within their own tribe and, um, you know, as you do. So there needs to be more <laughs> female investors and the government can actually play a role in supporting this so that they can invest in their own tribe as well. Um, those are some of the some of my thoughts, but I would love to hear um, your thoughts uh, somewhere and beauty your thoughts as well. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yes, there is a female investor in our country who will be sharing his experience as well in the later part. But uh, before to that one, I would like to know from Samar. Thank you so much, Beauty. I, I really think this is a very important question that you raised and, and all the points that were mentioned by Buke were, you know, spot on, uh, especially when it comes to research. I think research, as you mentioned, is truly the overarching umbrella of any policies that we need to work on because of primary importance in the coming phase is to design gender responsive policies. And this will only happen if we start collecting uh, gender disaggregated data. But um, for my part, I wanted to really focus in answering the question on the support that could be given to entrepreneurs. So I'll focus specifically on um, three uh, suggestions that I have, if I may. One is, of course, the support of governments and particularly, you know, economic stimulus in general, for example, tax breaks or perhaps um, one that I find extremely important is registering female businesses as suppliers for government contracts. I mean, it's, it's crazy that in this day and time, only 1% of government procurement goes to women-owned businesses. So this is a, a topic, you know, of priority that should be addressed, you know, to support uh, businesses as well. You know, you go around and say, I even posted on my LinkedIn yesterday, I'm like, buy or a service or a product from any female entrepreneur. So like governments also need to um, address that. And then when it comes to the private sector, I think support and subsidies in general from the private sector are really welcome and needed at this at this stage. So like if we talk about rent free support, for example, um, making an effort to avail more access to finance, which is critical and was touched upon by uh, Buke as well, whether through more, you know, gender lens, VC funds or angel investors, banking solutions, microfinance, you name it. I think we need to increase access to um, finance. Um, and thirdly, when it comes to international organizations and interventions by NGOs and so on, I would also um, uh, suggest, you know, uh, specifically addressing um, uh, female entrepreneurs with that support. So, for example, offering technical assistance and advisory services or fellowships, um, competitions for cash awards. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be done. And I, I keep repeating this, but really we all have a role to play, whether civil society organizations, private sector, public sector. You know, this whole notion of building back better will not happen by just blaming our government or blaming, you know, it's not a blame game. We're, we, we really are in this together and we have to um, truly work hard to drive this forward once this current phase is over and hopefully you have a vaccine in place just to get us started. Um, I mean, uh, and, and when it comes to international organization, I, w I, I just wanted to also mention, um, for example, that IFC, you know, the We5 Fund uh, mentioned, uh, talked about actually the difficulty of defining and tagging women-owned enterprises for others to support them. So, um, and, and also the fact that most of these businesses were in fields like mainly retail and service sectors, as, as you can mention, so hairdressing, uh, catering, domestic services, and so on. So maybe, you know, putting together a directory of these women, trying to um, facilitate access to them, if you will. Um, and, and obviously for opportunities for these women to overcome the crisis, uh, I would really stress on upskilling and reskilling, training, you know, finding yourself a mentor and, and most importantly, take care of yourself. You know, you need to, you need to be okay to be able to take care of others. So your personal well-being as a woman, as an entrepreneur, um, is, is critical for us to be able to move forward. So this is really a chance for all of us to rethink everything, all of these circumstances that surround us and, and, and really reflect on why have women 
you know, fared the worst in this crisis. Um, there are there are so many other factors, but I'll I'll stop here and pass over to you, Beauty. No, no it's okay. Uh, you uh, you have pointed thing about these issues, the, the challenges, and definitely I would like to say that although the challenges women are facing, there are some new doors that has been opened due to this COVID, because uh, there are, uh, you know, the number of uh, women entrepreneurs are increasing in our country after the COVID because of the e-commerce industries. So definitely there are some opportunities. So can you please uh, talk, uh, talk about a little bit opportunities so that we can actually understand what is happening. Do you want to start with me or should we, should we let the entrepreneurship experts go first? Yes, starting with Buki. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to, of course, talk uh, more about the ecosystem players uh, because, you know, that's where my expertise comes in. Um, I think... Um, for the ecosystem builders, there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, the governments, so we've just launched the, um, um, in collaboration with Prodam, the uh, Index of Dynamic Entrepreneurship reports. Um, and one of the highlights of the reports is that um, once this period is over, um, the governments, well, not necessarily before the end of the pandemic, but you know, before, before, um, after this short break, the governments will eventually come to the entrepreneurship support organizations and um, ask for their support. And they will, of course, go to the ones uh, that have the most um, experience, leverage, outreach, um, and look for solutions there. And I think it's all of the ecosystem builders role um, to bring uh, women uh, entrepreneurship into the equation. So I think uh, that's definitely coming up and I have faith uh, in the ecosystem uh, that uh, we will together uh, do this and we need to collaborate um, on this. Um, I think most of the world economies had already realized and they're even more so realizing that um, they cannot sustain or they cannot succeed if, 50% uh, of their population um, are not um, um, are, are not getting um, uh, equal treatment, are left behind. So I think uh, that fact is already out there and the mindset is shifting. I know, you know, there is still in many parts of the world, um, I'm Turkish, so um, I mean, I, I come from an, an, an emerging economy, um, there are um, debates about, uh, still debates about women's role and, you know, whether it's against uh, women's nature uh, to get involved in entrepreneurship or to get involved in um, duties outside uh, the domestic duty. I think um, we're doing, as part of, you know, being in this planet, we're doing so much against our nature now that we have really uh, passed that point. Um, we are, we have, there is almost... Uh, 8 billion of us, um, we have changed the climate, we have changed the biodiversity, um, there is 55% of us um, are living in urban areas. Um, these are all dynamics that, you know, maybe uh, the humankind previously was not expecting, but uh, we are there. So I believe the society norms uh, will also change that's coming. Um, in one of the panels before the panel on SDGs, um, Hazel Harrington said, um, we want to leave no one behind. And I think, you know, um, that's the principle uh, for us all uh, working in this ecosystem. We want to leave nobody behind um, and we need to work on that. And I will have some suggestions on how we can do this as well. But I would love to hear from Samar uh, what she has to say uh, in terms of um, the silver lining for entrepreneurs. Samar, please. Thank you, uh, Beauty. I mean, look, there's always a silver lining. I'm a big fan of silver linings. We always need to look at um, opportunities. And I think 
it's been an opportunity for entrepreneurs in general to um, I'll speak from from my personal experience. I've gone back to the drawing boards, you know. I've revisited my uh, business plan, my strategy. What is it that I'm doing? You know, the uh, event industry has been hardly hit. Do I want to focus on that now? What is really important in the coming phase? And it's it's really the the focus on uh, upskilling, reskilling, addressing the leaking pipeline of mid to senior level professionals. So really as a social enterprise, trying to address um, the needs. And frankly, in general, we all need to also mainstream this conversation on you know, uh, driving social impact in any business that you do. Like at the moment, as you rightly said, you could to think about the planet, to think about our surroundings, um, and, and this whole notion of, of recovering from the pandemic, this, this whole discourse about building back better will only happen if we do that. Um, so besides revisiting my, uh, my own uh, business, I've enrolled in a couple of courses i've actually identified a mentor which you know we were we usually get really busy in our daily lives and and forget about developing our own selves right so um so i've connected with a fantastic mentor during the lockdown um i've um besides uh, besides the course as well and everything i've i've managed to participate in, in in lots of wonderful events i've really become an intentional learner i've caught up on a lot of readings and i think the silver lining as well is the way we do business um i've come to realize that you know it's not important to go and have like a gazillion meetings in person in one day um there, I've become a lot more productive when my kids went back to school. May I just, <laughs> that's a disclaimer. Um, uh, I've become a lot more productive, um, you know, getting things done, really just stepping out when I really need to step out, but like getting so much done uh, on the computer. And I guess that's the beauty of the uh, digitization. I mean, we're here with you today. Perhaps under normal circumstances, we would have had to fly into your conference, right? But uh, it's amazing to be able to take part of such a global event, right, from, from where we are. So, so yes, always look at the silver lining. Um, although, yes, I know that it looks a little bit bleak at the moment, but uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, always. Thank you so much, Samar. Uh, yes, on this note, I would like to say that, yes, that COVID was the chance or the opportunity for me to organize such event and bringing so many global speakers together so i would say this is uh, any last few words from bookie um so i want to share a couple of things um at the beginning of global entrepreneurship week uh, we had this launch uh, event and um representatives from many countries attended. Um, and one of our managing directors, uh, Dave Moskowitz from New Zealand, um, in his remarks said something that I think uh, is really applicable uh, to us women uh, because uh, he talked about uh, New Zealand's uh, leadership, uh, about this environment, um, how she approached uh, the pandemic and um, he said he's got uh, three lessons from her. Um, the first one is be kind. The second one is be bold. The third one is be scientific. <laughs> and I think uh, we as women um, are um, all kind of um, in ways um, more closer to being like this than men. I, I must say, you know, okay, I'm going to be a little bit biased. Um, and my recommendation is um, if you feel like um, maybe you don't have um, some of those um, qualities, maybe you're not, you don't feel, you know, there with um, some of these um, ways of acting. Um, I think the best thing is, like Samar said, um, try to surround yourself with people who are acting like this, who are behaving this way, try to learn from them. Um, I'm really privileged uh, in my daily job uh, to be surrounded by people like this from around the world. It really is a privilege. 
which actually uh, does bring me to my second point. And um, I'm going to read um, a quote from uh, Michelle Obama, which I really like. Um, it's a little bit, it's a bit about um, privileged people. Um, and by privilege, uh, I mean, you know, if we are here today, uh, if you are here today listening uh, to this session, um, you are privileged. Uh, you have to accept that fact. And she says, if something good happens to you, if you have an advantage, uh, don't hoard it. You share it, you reach out, and you give back. And this wow. is something that I try to implement uh, in my daily life, and I would recommend this to you as well. Thank you so much, Samar, uh, for quoting such uh, valuable information from Michelle Obama. Uh, any last few words from Samar? Uh, I think yes. she was thinking about you when she said Samar. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote, by the way. Is it from her book, Becoming? Looks like, yeah, it was. it's a great book. Um, well, um, I mean, obviously, I second everything you said, uh, Buke, and particularly the parts you mentioned about leadership models, female leadership models that have come to surface during COVID-19. Uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand is but one example of, of several uh, fantastic success stories that have shown us, really, that women bring to the table characteristics that are perhaps unique to them, you know, better communicators, more empathetic, and, and a lot more. Um, but I would also add, as a, as a final point from my side, is you are a winner if you invest in female entrepreneurs. Simply put, it's not just me saying that. There are reports everywhere to support that. And just recently now, um, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, issued a report with a mass challenge, which specifically mentioned that businesses founded by women generate twice as much revenue per dollar invested than businesses founded by men. And, and in fact, uh, they even added an, a very alarming statistic that said, you know, VCs could have actually made 85 million US dollars over five years if they had invested equally in both the women and men founded startups that they studied during this uh, period. So it is good for business. It's not a nice to have. You know, so you should really uh, pay attention to it and, and look into it because we need to harness the, the, the skills and the talents of, uh, like you said, the 50% of the population. And if we are to build back better, if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals, you know, SDG 5 cuts across all 17 of them. So we will not be able to achieve it without them. So those would be my last words. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to share our thoughts on this really important topic. Thank you so much, Samar. Thank you, both of you. I enjoyed the session. Uh, with just talking to you, we had a great conversation regarding the entrepreneurial activities of women and during this COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us. So that brings the end of the session. But before to that one, I would like to say that, yes, this is an opportunity that has been come out from this session. And you can take the opportunity. Any problem is an problem is an opportunity. But when you have this opportunity, try to disseminate this opportunity to with each other then we can actually really have the impact in the society thank you so much for joining us that is the last uh, last session that we are going to have but after this one we'll have our closing ceremony don't go anywhere just come back and thank you for